So I'm writing the script for this video on the day the new iCarly series aired, and it's actually pretty good. Surely warms my millennial heart. One thing I'm happy about is that they used the original recording of the theme song, rather than doing a distasteful remix or something. But there's more to it than nostalgia. I've always thought this theme song was an absolute banger, and this video has been in my backlog before they even announced the revival. So what better time to make this than now? Let's talk about what makes this theme song so damn cool. This theme was written by Michael Corcoran, or as he's more colloquially known, the legendary Backhouse Mike. I don't normally talk about the behind the scenes for tunes, but I think it's fun context to know because he also wrote the Drake and Josh theme, the other Nickelodeon mid-2000s banger. But anyways, iCarly time. An important thing is that we'll be talking about the full version of the tune, rather than the version that was cut down for the actual show's theme song. It's mostly the same, but there are some key differences that we'll talk about. Let's listen to the first verse. The tune starts off with the classic mid-2000s reverse guitar into the fast shuffly shuffle drum feel. And the very first thing to analyze is the first note of the verse. We're in D major, which means the third note of our scale would normally be F sharp, but Miranda sings an F natural over the D major chord. I know out of context that sounds super whack, but in context it sounds like a bluesy flat 3, and the melody immediately gives us a proper F sharp after. You'll notice that the melody, and even some guitar lines, alternate between the two, creating an interesting dichotomy between the more major, Miranda Cosgrove internet sensation pop feeling, and that bluesy, grungier sound you would expect from someone named Backhouse Mike. One thing that is so tasteful about this tune overall is how the aforementioned Mr. Backhouse incorporates some cool harmonic movement without straying from the mid-2000s pop rock idiom. The entirety of the verse would otherwise hang on our homey one chord, the D major, in D major, but every fourth beat there's a subtle shift to G over D before going to D major on the next downbeat. This is just an awesome way to subtly introduce harmonic movement. G over D mostly just feels like a D sus4 chord, making us feel like we're never actually leaving the tonic, but still giving us a slight pull from the sus4 resolving to the third. Classic plagal resolution type beat. Also, remember the alternating between the flat 3 and natural 3 we talked about earlier? Listen to Drake Bell's guitar line at the end of the verse. This little guitar lick imitates Miranda's melody in the beginning of the verse, hitting the bluesy flat 3 and then grounding us in the major natural 3 on the next instance of the third. Let's see what comes next. After the verse, we have this amazing pre-chorus that probably sounds unfamiliar to you unless you previously listened to the full tune. This pre-chorus is cut in the actual show's theme, presumably in the interest of saving time, which is honestly a damn shame because this part is really great. On the topic of dichotomy, this pre-chorus serves as a perfect contrast to the relatively static harmonic movement of the verse. Right at the beginning of the pre-chorus, we get a different chord every quarter note. The bass movement is so nice, starting the pre-chorus on an inversion of our 1 chord, which moves up a half step to the 4, G major, then the 1 in root position, D major, then the 5, A major. One thing I find neat is the way the bass movement moves clockwise on the circle of fifths, which is relatively uncommon since harmonic resolution occurs from moving in the opposite direction, counterclockwise. What this accomplishes is building tension in the first measure, and then moving up a half step to the most unstable and stakesy chord, the F sharp 7 over A sharp, which resolves up a final half step to our B minor. Up until this point, apart from the melodic flat threes, nothing in this tune was non-diatonic. Everything in this pre-chorus builds until that F sharp 7, and Backhouse Mike finds the perfect place to give us our first non-diatonic chord, the secondary dominant of B minor, our 6. Since B minor is our relative minor, the resolution of this feels like a tonic in a sense, giving us a nice shift to a more minor flavor and feeling like an appropriate resolution, giving the building tension in the pre-chorus. The harmony underscores the lyrics perfectly as well. The verse's tone is more of a statement about Carly's general optimism, which fits the major optimistic tone of the verse's harmony. 
In the pre-chorus, however, our first line is, I will make you change your mind. The tone has shifted from reassuring musings to a command. Carly has stopped playing around and has decided your fate for you. And the tensiony harmonic movement in resolution to relative minor only accentuates the sentiment. But anyways, you guys don't watch this channel for lyrical analysis. Let's go back to the chords. After a second pass on that build up to B minor, it walks up again a half step to the unexpected C7 add 9. This chord is the chord that cemented the iCarly theme as GOAT theme song of the mid 2000s when I first heard it, which is why it's a shame that the 2021 iteration of the iCarly theme actually cuts this part of the pre-chorus as well. The Viacom executive's greed truly knows no bounds. But anyways, to get back to the chord, this chord is the flat 7-7 seven seven of D major. Maybe a bit unnecessarily technical for this kind of video, but flat 7-7 seven seven can have one of two functions. The first is the sub-5 of 6, or essentially a dominant chord that wants to resolve down to 6, in our case, B minor. The other, as we discussed in my previous video, link in the description, is flat 7-7 seven seven borrowed from parallel minor, in this case D minor, which wants to resolve up a whole step to our 1. In this case, we're hearing the latter, the upwards resolving flat 7-7, seven seven, which I'll explain in a second, but first let's talk about what else makes this chord so cool. First of all, let's discuss the chord's role in the form. Now at the end of our pre-chorus, we need something to set up an epic downbeat at the beginning of our chorus. The most obvious answer is 5-7, the classic diatonic chord that sets up a resolution to 1. But honestly, in context, and especially considering how the harmony has been building, it would sound anticlimactic and honestly kind of lame and hokey. So instead, Backhouse Mike looked to the relative axis and gave us the spicy modal interchange chord flat 7-7. Seven seven. It's easily the most non-diatonic chord you've heard thus far, with the C and B flat in the chord. And just to drive that home, we have those two notes as part of a dense chord in the background vocals. Also, look at the bass movement from the previous few chords. We walk up in half steps from the A major, to the F sharp 7 over A sharp, to the B minor, to the C7. And that's just buttery smooth voice leading. In addition to the ascending bass movement, the reason why we hear this chord as modal interchange rather than a sub-5 is because of the flat 3 in the following measure. This melodic flat 3 serves an additional purpose, now establishing the chord scale of mixolydian over this chord rather than lydian dominant. There's a whole unnecessary explanation for all of this, but the bottom line is, that F natural is cool. And now we finally land in the chorus. Let's listen. Let's take a look at our chord progression. It's a pretty standard 4, 5, 1, 6 for the first two bars, all diatonic, but then the second phrase, with almost the exact same melody, reharmonizes the last chord in the phrase, giving us the non-diatonic F sharp 7. Does something seem vaguely familiar about this chord progression? Notice how the melody here is exactly the same as the previous phrase, but whereas the first time around it was expected and diatonic, this time adds a little bit of spice with the E7 and resolves differently than before. One of my absolute favorite things, reharmonizing the same melody but introducing a harmonic twist the second time. This kind of thing happens fairly often, especially in anime openings, but what makes this stand out so much to me is both the placement in the chord progression and in the form overall. But before we talk about that, let's briefly talk about chord functions. There are generally three functions of chords in music, tonic, subdominant, and dominant. Tonic chords like our one and often our six are stable chords that you can really just sit on. Dominant chords, like 5 or 5 of 6, are tensiony and serve to pull us into their respective tonics. Subdominant chords are more ambiguous in their function and can mostly go wherever they want without feeling deceptive, but commonly are used to precede their respective dominant chord, hence the name. Let's analyze our melody using these chord functions. The chorus starts on 4, subdominant, going to 5, dominant, going to 1, tonic, and then 6 minor, our relative minor tonic. This is perhaps the most standard order of the chord functions, with the subdominant preceding the dominant and the dominant taking us into a tonic, which goes into the other tonic to end the phrase. But the next phrase does something different. We have the same 4-5-1, but then we land on the F sharp 7, the 5-7 of 6, which acts as a dominant functioning chord that wants to land on its respective tonic, the 6. But what happens instead is a deceptive resolution back to the 4. This is probably my favorite part of the tune. Look at what the inner voice in the background vocals does. Ah. 
against the melody, it sounds like this. See the brighter side of every situation. Thanks, Kiyomi, for singing that. Such a tasteful chord progression with the descending line in that inner voice. Just a really appropriate thing for the end of a theme song, but something that is rarely heard, especially in this medium. That last chord in the sequence, the E7, is a special dominant chord that wants to resolve auxiliarily to the 2 minor, E7, which would normally want to go into the 5 and then end our tune on the 1. But in a classic backhouse mic fashion, it goes right into that grungy flat 7-7, seven, seven, taking us straight into the end on our 1. And that's pretty much all there is to it. The full version of the tune continues with another verse, chorus, bridge, and another chorus, but there really isn't anything that interesting or different to talk about, so yeah. So I had a Drake Bell related joke written for this last part, but uh, due to fairly recent events, it's a tad poorly aged. So instead, <laughs>